Today we are beginning our new sermon series called Words to Live By. Each week in this series, we will be talking about all the ways that God is at work in our lives and how God calls us into the transformed life with him. Words to live by, words to carry with us every day that challenge us and encourage us and, of course, give us hope. Today, our words to live by, or word to live by, is freedom. And it comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, to the Galatians. Hear now the word of God. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let freedom ring. And man, we have, right? I can, uh, this week we've celebrated our country's Independence Day. The freedom that we have here in America. Everyone finds different ways to celebrate But this week, I think I can still hear the echoes of the fireworks. Anybody else? The other night, I had to ask Hugo because I was like, is something happening? It was only July 2nd, but they had already started. And there, but you know, traditionally, everybody celebrates it different, but traditionally, we'll wear our red, white, and blue, and then we um, will, there will be fireworks and all kinds of things that are echoing through the night, speeches and lots of politics, but also the barbecue, right? It's so good. And of course, especially if it's paired with something like a good old potato salad or ice cream for me, I loved the ice cream this year. And as far as I can tell, For those of us who live down here in the South, we really like to find a way to cool off. So usually we find a way to get to some sort of water, be it the pool, the lake, the ocean, or a sprinkler. Who knows? We just want to cool off a little bit. Speaking of which, some of us celebrate good old Independence Day by enjoying the wonderful gift of air conditioning. And we just say a little prayer of thanks, especially as it comes up in the midst of July. We said to be grateful for our freedom that is found in our country. But today, I wonder, how are we celebrating? How are you celebrating the gift of freedom that Christ has given you? What are you doing each day with the gift of freedom that has been given to you? We find many ways to celebrate the freedom that um, we have, our national freedoms. We have a holiday, and we find ways each day to do something that celebrates that freedom. But I wonder, what are we doing to celebrate our original gift of freedom? The gift that God gives us, the gift of free will, and Christ, as Christ sets us free. Is there a possibility that we have taken it for granted and not considered how our living in freedom is an expression of our faith? Well, sure there is. We have definitely taken it for granted. It's a privilege of grace. It's a privilege of grace and of being loved. 
But today, we are going to talk about this gift of freedom and the joy found in freedom and what it means for us as Christians to live in and celebrate that freedom daily or this freedom daily. First, though, we have to start with an understanding that freedom is a great gift that comes out of God's love for each of us. God gives us free will because of God's love for us. And God wants us to be free so that we can choose to love God freely, that we can respond back to God's love with love. And when our love fails and we, su we submit ourselves to the bondage of sin and slavery, we resubmit ourselves to our flesh and the temptations of our flesh. But in this amazing act of love and grace, God sends us Jesus to give us freedom, to show us how to live free, to break the chains of sin and shame, and to shine light in the darkness so that we can see our way out so that we don't have to live in the cycles of sin, but that every day we can resist temptation. Every day we can wake up and choose joy and live in hope. When we were talking about the words to live by, this was easily mine because freedom is where we find the joy it gives us the joy to live every day. I get to choose it every day. We are not truly trapped by the temptations. Now we are most definitely tempted every single day, right? Um, but because we live, because of Jesus Christ, we can live in freedom and we can live and resist that temptation. But what this means is that we must submit ourselves to the will of God. It is not in our power, but in the power of God, the Almighty, that we can be transformed. Each of us has struggles, different struggles with different temptations. Just like in the way that we all celebrated the 4th of July differently, we all have different temptations and struggles that we face daily. And we may not recognize it, what those uh, temptations and struggles are right off, but I would define it or say that it's anything that has the ability to trap you. Anything that has the ability to get between you and your creator. The things that cause harm, the things that the cycles of hurt and shame all of those barriers to loving God, being loved by God, all of these things are barriers of sin. They're the shackles of sin, if you will. For some of us, they're really easy to identify after a while. Drinking is a way of life that eventually is understood as a form of self-medicating from something. We now understand and call this alcoholism. It has a diagnosis and a 12-step program. For some of us, those are easy. It's hard to even identify that one at first to know that you're trapped in it. And then some of the shackles that we wear and that we bear are not as easy to identify even though they're uncomfortable for us, they become this uncomfortable, gaudy bracelet. We begin to dress them up and make excuses for the reasons that we wear them. But they're not actually a part of who we are. They're not a part of us. This may look in like different forms, but in one of them is anger. That living in anger or hatred where it comes back every day and it traps you, or jealousy that can easily turn into something that leads you to gossip, to spread harmful words and give those nasty looks. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We hold on to these things. 
this hatred and this harm, and they become the cages that we live in. And although they're hard to identify, as we live in relationship with Jesus Christ, we can do the work in identifying those cages and begin to, to let go of the things of this world and cling instead to the empty cross and grave knowing that there is freedom for each of us as we walk the pathway of discipleship and we learn to live in the freedom that we are given with joy and rejoicing. There is so much joy to be had. There is joy found in freedom. But now I'm going to be the first one to tell you this work is not easy. I would actually argue that it's quite hard, especially when we're just starting out. But in each day when we wake up, we have this new opportunity to live in the freedom found in Jesus Christ. My favorite example of this is one time me and my grandmother did Weight Watchers together. I was in college and uh, we were trying to lose a little weight, you know, and so we were like, we signed up together and we were gonna do it. And that night, anybody ever heard of Weight Watchers? Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's a point system to help you lose weight. Okay, so grandma, I'm asleep and grandma comes in one night and she wakes me up. She goes, Elizabeth. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, there is a hot fried peach pie downstairs and it is calling my name. And I said, oh, Grandma, we've heard of this diet. She goes, I know, I know. She goes, but it's calling my name. I said, I think it's calling mine too. And down we ran the stairs, and we, we did not resist evil, the evil forces of the peach pie. She said, you know, we'll start again tomorrow. I said, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, and so we did. We got up the next morning, and we had our little bowls, and we counted our points and whatnot. It's not easy to resist. I'm, I know it's funny, but y'all, this is serious, and I don't want to make too light of it because it really is a serious thing. It's hard work to resist the evil forces of wickedness in this world, but we can. With God's help, we can. Paul tells us, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, but instead live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Each day we are given this opportunity to wake up and live in the freedom found in Jesus Christ. In his letter, Paul is writing to encourage and remind the church not to get caught up in the weight of human issues and the weight of the issues of the flesh live into the gift of freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. These missionaries had come behind him and they were they had been raised in the Jewish tradition and they went to these new Christian communities that had never uh, that were pagan before and that did not know about the Torah or any of the Moses and the law they were very confused and they came in and they stirred up the pot and they told them that they could not be in relationship with the Almighty unless they were circumcised and they changed their diet and they submitted themselves to the law of Moses and fortunately these friends aren't these missionaries they had missed it they had missed out on the freedom of exactly what Christ had done for them and for any of those who were open to God's love Christ fulfills the law in an act of love and grace and creates an open pathway directly to God he creates an open channel so that we can be in relationship with God Almighty. Now, I know that I didn't live there and that there are a good 2,000 years of culture and language that we're translating through. But I, I do know people and I can kind of understand and read with grace what is going on in this with all of this. There are two things that I would say are, that are definitely happening here. And one is that that's the way it has always been. 
How many of y'all have ever heard that in church before? But this is how we've always done it, right? This is how it's always been done. We must do it this way because this is what we've always done. Change is scary. But this is how they had always known. They were raised to, that the law was the right way. The other thing that's going on is that they had those feelings, you know, that come with this is what we had to do. This is how we understood it. So this is what you should have to do too. And there's a sincere sense of unfairness that kind of comes out to play that we had to do it and so should you. But y'all, we learn all too fast that life isn't fair and that certainly freedom and fairness are not the same. And although God is just, life itself is not fair. I personally feel like fairness is what has given us that sense of entitlement that is plaguing our world. You are not entitled to freedom. It has been given to you. It has been fought for and given to you. And it's not fair. Life is not fair. It's certainly not fair that Jesus, the Son of God, had to humble himself by coming on earth and being born into the flesh. And then to be raised by this community for them to turn on him he was tortured and crucified by his own people, by his neighbors and his loved ones. That's not fair. And God gives us no misconceptions that life would be fair. And if you don't believe me, there's a parable about it where Jesus talks about these workers who had worked all day long from dawn to dusk come along about lunchtime and they begin to work and there's a few more that come they show up just like a blister you know when the work is almost completely done there they are and at the end of this very long day they all receive the same pay <sighs> oh goodness and those who had worked all day they looked around and they said well Jesus this isn't fair and Jesus said, it ain't up to you. Grace is not of this world. It is a gift from God, and it is up to God to administer this gift of grace as God sees fit. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, I have to say that Jesus didn't actually say ain't. That's a Liz paraphrase. But it's the truth. Life isn't fair, but thank you, Jesus, <laughs> that it is not up to us and to other people to judge us. It is up to God to administer the gift of grace. But Jesus also tells us in another parable in Luke, he tells us to whom much is given, much is required of them. So they must consider and decide what they're going to do with it just like it's up to each of us to think about what are we doing with our freedom that has been given by God. And let me tell you, it is, a, it is much. We have been given much in the freedom, the love, the grace, the mercy that is poured out from God. So yes, it means that there is much required of us in return you have to be a good steward of the freedom that has been given to you. And Paul holds us right here in this tension of being good stewards of the freedom that Jesus has given us. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. Whoa, 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 Paul. This is a lot, but it comes from Jesus. As Paul continues, he says, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment that you should love your neighbor as yourself. But if, however, you bite and devour one another, take care 
Take care that you are not consumed by one another. In other words, always find a way back to the freedom, back to the gift of God's grace that has been given to you. I hear the echoes of a peacemaker being there. So what are you doing with your freedom? Do you wake up each day and submit yourself before God? Or at least after you've had a cup of coffee, right? Do you take a deep breath and breathe in the breath of life that God has given you in each day and let go of the pains of this world? If even for just a moment, are you choosing to live in joyful obedience to God? Joyful obedience. It's an interesting phrase, is it not? In our communion liturgy, during our confession, our, the prayer of confession, we pray to be freed for joyful obedience. We pray this prayer as we also seek to live in peace with God and with one another. That's part of the purpose of it. And that, that phrase, joyful obedience, it's always stuck out to me. It's always been curious to me um, for this, what, it, what does it mean to be obedient and be joyful about it? I think the reason that it sticks out is because obedience is one of those sticky things in life that's been misused, that has been abused in many situations with leadership. And so it kind of puts us on that suspicious, and we feel suspicious when we hear it. What are you telling me to be obedient to? But perhaps that is the wrong question. It's not about what you're supposed to be obedient to, but the who you're supposed to be obedient to. The who. Obedience to God. Now that, that is something to lean into. God who loves us, who cares so much for each of us. God who creates us and frees us and knows the number of hairs on our head or not on our head. God who is the creator of heaven and earth and who's bringing heaven to earth for us. God, obedience to God, the almighty, who is so reckless with his love that he would leave the 99 to come after you to come after you when you are weary and lost. Yes, church, I think we can do this, right? We can live in joyful obedience to a God who loves us this much. We can joyfully trust God to lead us and to guide us in the ways that lead to peace and joy every day. Again, I want to say it is not easy and accepting the gift of God's love. But whenever we do, when we accept that gift, we receive the best, most incredible cheerleader from the Almighty God, the Alpha and Omega. Can you just see God's presence or feel God's presence over your shoulder going, you got this, you don't have to eat the peach pie. It doesn't matter that the ice cream is cold. It's okay. You can pass it up. You can turn away. There are other good things for you to enjoy. You can imagine God as your cheerleader. I'm, again, I'm making light, but this is huge. This is the God, the Almighty, who can cheer you through hard relationships, hard conversations. Anybody ever been in a hard conversation? Yes, and they're happening all the time where you can say, God can say, you can be the peacemaker. I can give you the words. You've got this. I'm behind you. I've got your back. You can walk away from that temptation. You don't have to do that. You can make it. 
You can stand in front of the giants of this world like David did, and you can say, I serve the living God, and know that God is right there and has your back. That's what being freed for joyful obedience, that's what it is. It's submitting to the God, the Almighty, the one who loves you, who is your cheerleader. In talking to a dear friend um, who battles alcoholism, they say, she would say, I fight for my sobriety every day. Every single day, it is a fight. And she said, it is not in my own strength that it is possible. It is absolutely not possible for me to do it alone. But every day that I submit myself before God, I can feel the weight lifted. I can feel the power it has had over me roll away. It is the freedom that I have and found in Christ Jesus that I am able to live free, that I am able to choose something else, that I am able to pass it by. This is a testimony. It's a testimony to each of us. So, what do we do with the freedom? Will we choose to obey the commandment to love God above all else, above all the other things? Let's love God. And out of this love will flow the love for one another. It will be obvious where we can encounter others and their weird quirks and their arguments and all their oddities and all the things. And we can love them right where they are, even when we disagree, even when we don't like something that they do or say, we can lay down our swords of anger, possibly be more curious and ask questions, or just walk away knowing that they are a sacred love child of God, and you are too, and although you disagree, you're still united in that love. but not letting the things of this world pull us from the love of God and the love of neighbor. We can let them roll away. In the freedom of Christ, to live in the freedom of Christ is to live in joy. There's this song that I love that I heard. It was in a Methodist church, I kid you not. I walked in and we were singing it. It's, uh, I don't know who wrote it or any of the things, but the one I hear is by Eddie James. He sings it and you can look it up. And I encourage you to do so, because it is so good. Um, but it, all of a sudden I walked in and everybody was celebrating the freedom that they found in God. We were dancing and clapping and all kinds of things. I know y'all are looking at me all weird like, in a Methodist church? No, ma'am, yes, I'm telling you. It was so good, and it spoke to my soul, and I was like, this is it. This is a part of who I am. To live in joy is to live in this freedom. And so I want to share just a little bit of it with you. Uh, I do not, I'm a joyful noisemaker, you know what I mean? I'm not, um, a, it's not going to sound pretty if I was to sing it, but here are some of the words. It goes like this. I want to clap a little louder than before. I want to sing a little louder than before. I want to jump a little higher than before. I want to shout a little louder than before. Freedom, freedom. And it continues where he sings, I want to clap a little louder before. I want to lift my hands a little higher than before. I want to love you more than before. I want to worship deeper than before. I got to scream a little louder than before because freedom, freedom. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yes, Lord, lift your hands to the Father and say, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. And then it says, come on, lift your hands to Jesus. Now help me dance the dance of freedom. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This is what it means to live in the freedom of God's love. This is what it means to live in the freedom of Christ. It means you can do it. All the other things roll away as you walk the path of discipleship and you are freed to dance in worship for the pain, even if it's just for a moment to fall away because when you spend time with God, you are transformed and all the things of the world fade away and there is joy and there is goodness. And all of a sudden you're in a Methodist church and you are clapping and you are jumping and you are twirling and you are singing louder than before. And you know, you know that that freedom and that joy is deep in your soul, that it can carry you forward. So I invite you, I invite you to live in the freedom of Christ. I invite you to receive the gift of God's grace, to live in the love of God and let it shine through you. Let it carry you forward and let the rest, all the, the worries of this world, let them be rolled away. But for you, let this be your song, your freedom song, that with Christ you can do all things you can make it and God has got your back live in the freedom the life and the love of God always and forever amen